Little kids seem to find a way to turn everything into a game or a toy. A simple stick is all of a sudden a wizard's staff as they cast spells upon their classmates. A series of large rocks becomes islands, each child claiming one as their own, viciously defending their new territory. A trickle of water in the backyard is a young person's ideal afternoon, the ability to slowly determine where the water goes while envisioning dams, cities, and little people scurrying for safety. Children are creative. This is a fact that few seem to dismiss or refute. We watch it happen so frequently that sometimes, imagination and creativity are thought of as childish or childlike traits. In this manner, we have come to believe a great deal of things about creativity. I've worked with many people over the years who claim to lack an imagination, or as many have said, I don't have a creative bone in my body. This seems odd though, considering how ubiquitous it seems to be in children. Do we lose creativity as we grow? Does it evaporate as hormones take hold of our bodies as we hit puberty? Let's start with something simple. What is creativity? Defining it is not as easy as many other terms I have looked into. Loosely, it relates to creating, but culturally, we seem to mean something more akin to this. The ability to solve problems in novel ways, to use an imagination to fabricate new ideas and concepts, or to think in non-traditional patterns to solve a particular question. At some level, creativity seems to simply be a state of being that is opposite to routine. To be creative, as it were, is to look outside of the normal, whatever that might be for the particular situation being discussed. Well now, let's take a look at some preconceptions, or maybe misconceptions, about creativity, how it functions, and where it comes from. Many of these are pervasive in our culture, predominantly because we as humans love to put things in boxes. So if this sounds like your cup of tea, please consider subscribing, and let's take a look. The first misconception, you are born with it. This is a sinister place to start. Of course, since children have this in such abundance, believing that we are simply born with the capacity to be creative in some fashion is not altogether uncalled for. Branching from that assumption, it must be an innate quality. We can allow ourselves to chew on this for a moment, because it very well might be true. The sinister component here is subtle, that we are each born with a certain capacity for creativity, and we live eternally within those bounds. Of course, it is more common to see this in youth, but comparison and the expectations of others begin to wear on young people. Novel ideas, things that their peers and parents were so excited about months earlier, are no longer receiving attention. When a child draws a picture, regardless of how accurate it might be, parents are excited to see the depiction. It is a representation of growth, of analysis, of the joy that their child gets when they draw the people closest to them. But I have seen the same action taking place with an eight-year-old or a middle school student who brought their prized depictions to their parents only to receive a dismissive hand wave. You ought to be doing your homework, they might say, or push the child toward more productive things, like sports in the eyes of many American parents. Occurrences like this might be rare, but society as a whole does this more and more as children grow. And in the United States education system, we push far more towards stability and conformity than we do toward innovation and creativity. Being like everyone else is rewarded. Fitting in is rewarded, both socially and academically. If you are the one trying to solve problems in an alternate fashion while everyone else tries to follow instructions or simply asks questions instead of innovating, you will fall behind. The system does not reward creativity, and so it often falls away. This is a tragic thing, because if we really think about it, the people that we value most as a society, the creators, the innovators, they ask difficult questions. And though it might be trite to talk about this, so many of the smartest people in our society, of the inventors, the people who build new things and bring crazy new things like the internet and computers and cell phones into existence, struggled in the American education system. Because that system is predicated on treating students, young people, as if they are simply cogs that are going to fit into the industrial complex. 
And really, if we look at where education in America comes from, that's kind of the idea, as our education system really descends from the Prussian system that was brought over. And it really was to kind of treat us like individual pieces that were to fit into an industrializing world. So in this misconception that you are simply born with a certain amount of creativity, it is far more frequent that the creativity that existed has simply melted away. As for the fact that you may only have a certain amount of creativity and that resource is finite, well, we'll get to that in some future points. The second misconception is creativity is instinctive. This might be better stated as creativity is only instinctive. Obviously, there is much instinct that comes into play with creativity. Much of mine is instinctive, actually, having not had my creativity and imagination drained from me over the years, perhaps. I've had many people ask me how I come up with ideas, where I conjure these random drawing ideas from, and I have to think hard to actually be able to give a reason. It is instinctive for me. My mind is always conjuring things, producing ideas, to the point where sometimes sleep is a struggle because an idea will occur to me right before I drift into the ether. And if I don't wake up at that moment and write it down or draw it or jot some notes, I'm not sleeping that night. But that only gets me so far. When you begin to follow an idea, you realize ideas are cheap. They are the fumes that are quick to ignite, but they burn out fast. The idea for a great story is 1% of the work of a good book or film. Everything that precipitates from that is covered by hard work. Instinct might give you a head start, the initial idea, or hold your hand as you begin moving through topics, but it will not solve the problem or create the masterpiece. Work is always required to actually yield any manner of result. In class, this mindset was easy to see. When I introduced prescriptive projects, the students would often take stubborn stances, upset that they did not get to make all of their own decisions. Following these, I would often give far more open-ended assignments, and the response was usually excitement, followed by apprehension and an inability to decide what to do, how to proceed forward. The solution was usually somewhere in the middle. Give the students a little push towards something, almost like a jumpstart for a car, and then let them figure out the rest. One of my favorite projects that I did this way was a project where I would give students a set of bones, not actual bones, they were pictures of bones, skeletons of different animals. I tried to pick animals where the skeletal structure was particularly difficult to ascertain. This is really easy when you look at any mammalian, uh, aquatic mammalian animals, things like whales, manatees, seals. Their skeletal structures are a little bit strange. They look more like sea serpents or dinosaurs that lived in the water. So I would give them a sheet that had maybe 16 to 18 examples of animals like this. And I would tell them that they had to try, at least, to pick an animal that they did not understand at first. They looked at the skeleton, they went, I don't know what that is. And their task was to take that, analyze the skeleton, and then try to figure out what kind of animal that might be. And as the project proceeded, they would sketch out what that animal might look like, and they would draw a finished example of that animal. And if the project went well, only after all their final executions existed would I show them what animals belonged to those skeletons. And of course the results were crazy, but giving them the piece to start from, they had the physical structure that they had to wrap things around, was a lot easier for most students than it was if I just said, hey, create your own you know, fantastic creature, but it also has to follow all the laws of physics on Earth. So giving them something to work from was basically cutting out the instinct. There are students obviously who have the instinct that I could just go create a fantastic creature and they go, Done, I'll, I'll see you in an hour. But for most humans, having something to build upon, some foundation, was far more applicable, far more doable for them. Now, a lot of students that I had in that scenario and in many others felt as if they didn't have any creativity because they felt like they couldn't do things on instinct. They couldn't draw from their, from their memory or from imagination. And largely it came from watching other students that they just assumed were super creative and then looking at them and going, well, I can't do that, so I obviously don't have an imagination. Some of this stems from a desire not to fail, a desire to not look silly or stupid in comparison to somebody else who seems so proficient. But again, this is assuming that instinct is a necessary component. And just like I talked about with the skeleton project, 
every student was able to come up with something interesting. Sometimes they were really close to the original and they were kind of boring, but they were always creative. They were always imaginative. They were always different. And just giving that tiny little bit of foundation for them to build upon was all that they needed to move forward. So no, creativity is not instinctive alone. Though instinct does play an important part for many people, it is not a necessary component. There are plenty of artists in my life, plenty of artists that you know, who are fantastic drawers, fantastic creators, but they just don't come up with ideas very readily. And you know what? that doesn't make you less creative. It just means that you don't have quite the instinct for idea creation as someone else. And you know what? Welcome to being human. Misconception three, creativity is only a skill for artists. Now I know that this podcast is directed towards artists and creatives in general, but let's, let's spend a minute here. There are two sides to this. The notion that only artists of one sort or another have ample creativity and that you have to have this ample creativity to actually be an artist. Those are the two pieces. Let's start with the first, that only artists have an abundance of creativity. I am unsure where this notion comes from, but it is very common. I heard it frequently in school, both as a student, but also as a teacher, more among my colleagues than the students, mind you. It often presented itself in a flippant comment. Oh, I can't solve this problem, or I'm not very creative, so let's let the art people solve this. Gotta love that, don't you? At first, like many things in academia, it seems to have a compliment component to it. Before you realize it may actually be a backhanded compliment with subtle intonations of condescension. In a lot of ways though, this misconception is dismissive of one's self. It is a complicated thought. The thought that I do not possess this quality and the reason behind that is a simple categorization of mindset. I am not an artist and therefore I am not creative. As you likely know, and most people would agree if they pause for a moment to think about the statement, this is not true. Many of the most creative people we see in our world are engineers and business people. Are they artists? Well, I guess if you have to extend the definition to include them, then you have stepped outside of a simple definition we use on a daily basis to define art, and whilst there is no harm in that, you have expanded a definition to reach a definition. Something akin to defining a word with the word itself, rather than using additional and exterior context to do so. So no, creativity is not relegated to artists alone. It is a human skill. One that some are born with an abundance of perhaps, but one that regardless of starting quantity can be developed and built by any person who decides to embark on that journey. In my professional life, I saw this notion, frankly, as an excuse. Creativity is hard and it is easy to be dismissive, to hand wave the task to an artist rather than attempt to solve it yourself. It is easier, right? If you can go, creativity is hard, so I will pass this off to someone I assume has this innovation quality naturally. They didn't earn it, they were born with it. And so the universe or God has equipped them with this ability and has not thusly equipped me, and so I will happily hand it off to them and I don't have to think about my own lack in this moment. Chances are there is truth here, but that you are underselling yourself if this is the perspective you take. You can develop your creativity, your ability to innovate, but if you push off tasks that require that innovation, you will never grow in that category. To close out this particular notion, think of this from the perspective of lifting heavy objects. If you as a person handed off each physical task to someone else, your own muscles would never get any exercise. In time, they might atrophy entirely, crippling your ability to do anything physical. If you were to lift as much as you could in each scenario, gathering support when necessary, you would gradually become stronger, able to lift heavier things, and eventually you would find yourself a muscular superstar. The same is true with creativity. Hand off the creative tasks and you eliminate your own ability to grow in those scenarios. Now let's talk about the second of the notions here, that you are only a real artist if you have an abundance of creativity. This is dangerous. Many young artists will look to their competition, a discussion perhaps for another time, uh, and simply decide that they are in no way, shape, or form as creative as those other artists. This can quickly spiral into the following thoughts. I am not as creative as other artists. I am not as creative as real artists. Maybe I am not an artist. Maybe I'm not capable of being an artist. This might seem like a quick downhill slide, but the same creativity we have for our artwork also seems to be used to construct false narratives about ourselves. I must return to something I talked about on a previous podcast about comparison. 
When we look at other artists, we are only seeing a small portion of curated content. We are not seeing the hundreds of iterations, the sketching, the background that actually gives us the true data on how long it took them to come up with their ideas, let alone how long it took them to execute on said idea. We are seeing what looks like beautiful, spontaneous generation. It is easy to leap to the assumption that they come up with their ideas on the spot, that they spring out of the air like fairies, and that since we lack such an ability, perhaps we are out of our league. I was struck by this personally just the other day. On our Discord, link in the description, we work together on weekly drawing prompts. A good friend of mine threw up their final, and I was stunned by the quick and meaningful execution of so many elements. In my mind, I went, oh goodness, look at how well they achieved the musculature, the background, the lighting. And when I glanced back at my own drawing, I was disappointed with what I had just produced. Then a little later, this artist posted their reference sheet. I was surprised, stupidly, to see that he had two dozen images of specific poses, musculature, trash, boxes, peanut butter, and all sorts of things. I had used no references for mine. Not that I needed to. It was a small weekly drawing, but I had wrongfully assumed, as I looked at my friend's piece, that he had pulled the thing out of thin air. Of course he didn't, like an intelligent artist realizing that he could improve his piece by pulling from the wealth of knowledge that he has around him, he looked things up, he practiced, and he had several references. This is an easy situation to find ourselves in though, to assume that all of the other artists are simply more creative than we are, and perhaps that we do not have what it takes to be an artist. Creativity is not limited to artists. It is an integral component of being human, of solving problems and figuring out new ways to interact with the world. If you are an artist, you feel like your creativity is lacking in comparison to others? So what? Maybe you're right and you need to hone the skill. And maybe you have forgotten that what you see in others' work is just never the whole story. The next misconception. Creativity is only about idea generation. This is a common misconception, that creativity is centered solely on the creation of ideas. There is truth in this, just like many of the others. Creativity does tie into the creation of ideas, but this is the easiest and simplest part of the process. Now, for some people, coming up with ideas is quite difficult, but even if that is you, keep to the faith. The greater work of creativity is always in the work that follows. Like I mentioned earlier, ideas are cheap. The work that follows is difficult and takes much time. And the true heart of creativity is in the constant and consistent problem solving as you move through the execution of ideas. When you come up with an idea for a beautiful drawing or painting, you now have the prompt. You basically now have the ability to begin. But as you dive in, you start dissecting concepts, devising your composition, start thinking about the placement of objects, you are creatively solving the problems that lay before you. This portion of the process is far less glorious, but it is where creativity truly comes to shine. So coming up with the ideas is the easy part. And though it's not easy for everyone, it is inevitably the easiest component of the thing. When I sit down to come up with an idea for a painting, that's pretty much me sitting on my iPad trying to find a good reference photo for something. And once I do, then I've got a couple other quick decisions to make. I found a beautiful photograph of a pelican that of course is copyright free and I can use and then sell later, right? And then I determine what size canvas I'm gonna work on, which might mean that I have to crop the image a little bit. And after that, I'm gonna lay down my first layer of paint and then a sketch. So in that painting so far, the creativity has come from picking the size of the canvas and the reference photo. Maybe you could say that the creativity lies in the sketch, but with how fast I sketch them out, I wouldn't go that far. Now I start with my first paint strokes on that piece. And every single paint stroke is creatively making a decision about what I want the finished product to be. It's not that creativity doesn't exist in the beginning, it's just that it exists the entire time. It's just more subtle. It's harder to think about every single brush stroke being a creative decision, but it really is. Last night when I was working on one of the weekly drawings for our Discord channel, I was working on a city within a tree. And I started with some really, really loose sketching that I didn't hold to as I went. Um, and that's part of the creative process there as well is I'm not marrying myself to ideas early on. I'm just gonna lay down some lines and see what happens. But 
I was making decisions throughout the entire process about how I shaded something, how dark I wanted it to be. Some of those were logical decisions. Would this be in shadow? But some of them were also just interesting decisions. What color would look best here? Does it really make sense for there to be blue things hanging underneath a giant tree where all the structures are made out of wood? No. Um, you know, world building wise, I can kind of come up with some ideas for why they might have blues if they're crushing animals or something <laughs> and to make weird dyes, or maybe it's some kind of flower or a fruit that the tree produces. But at the end of the day, like that decision was there to create contrast. It was a creative decision because it makes things more interesting. And in the painting example as well, I was making decisions the whole time as I moved through that piece, trying to figure out how detailed I want the background. If I need to do this in three or four paint strokes or if one would suffice. Usually using one paint stroke will leave much more interesting uh, marks on the canvas later. So you have to get past the notion that you're just making the creative decisions at the beginning. Sometimes you're making the biggest ones, the most stressful ones, the ones that allow you to actually move forward, but you're certainly not making all of them at the beginning of the project. Coming up with the idea is creative, but it is only a portion of the process. Creativity is honed, is most utilized in the trenches of warfare when it comes to art. Simply working, slowly working, lifting your idea from an ethereal concept to something of beauty. Next misconception, creativity is finite. There is a prevalent thought that creativity is like a resource eventually used up, or maybe if you're lucky, it slowly regenerates over time. This is perhaps accurate if you are referring to inspiration. Inspiration does seem to be quite fickle, coming and going like some Greek muse, weaving its way into our lives only to flicker out of existence when we need it most. Inspiration does seem to be more finite, at least in the way we often think about the concept, but creativity need not be. Perhaps in our metaphor of lifting that I used earlier, creativity is more akin to a muscle. It gets tired and often needs a day or two to recover if we overuse it. But that is certainly far more manageable than the other thoughts. In my experience, creativity is not finite. It does not expire and it does not run dry. There are a few situations that might be beneficial to talk about here though. Creativity is difficult when times get hard. When your life is in a difficult spot, if work is really drawing upon you, if you haven't been getting enough sleep, if things are really difficult, creativity is often more difficult as well. Now, this is the case for me. The more stressed or anxious I am, the harder it is to be creative. Though, for some people, this is exactly the opposite. And again, we come back to the strange fact that artists are such a weird breed of human that for me, creativity is so massively inhibited by my stress or anxiety or how difficult my life is, and yet we probably all know people who just blossom when times are hard, at least their creativity does. This has actually given rise to some like really bad stereotypes about artists and needing trauma or needing like difficulty in their life in order to come up with good content. It's not true categorically, but I can definitely see where it comes from. Creativity is difficult when your mental health is not in a good place. If you are depressed or you struggle with depression, those things can make it much harder to be creative. Being creative is often a risky endeavor, and if you already feel like you are spread super thin, then creativity can be all the more difficult. Again, for some people though, it is the exact tool that they need to work through those tough times. It's really hard, but if your life is difficult right now or you're struggling with some mental health and creativity also feels like it's a struggle, the two might be linked. Creativity is often most easy to manage when you are in homeostasis, when things are good or normal and you're content or as content as you can be with the way that life is. For artists, this is more of a push to make sure you have safe spaces in your life, physical spaces to retreat to in order to work, but also safe places with safe people emotionally and mentally so that your creativity can be sustained and fed. I've talked about this in some other videos, particularly I think the one on self-care, but it's really important for us as artists to allow our creativity to blossom. I like to think about um, art or creativity in this sense like a plant. It needs particular things in order to grow. So get away from the muscular you know, weightlifting one or get into something I enjoy more, which is growing things. If your creativity and your art are like a seedling, they need a specific amount of light they can't have too much light or too little light. Can't have too much water or too little water. They have to have the right kind of nourishment in the soil. And this is just when they're an infant. 
Once you get them outside, you have to worry about things like wind. It's extraordinarily windy outside. So if you're hearing that in the background today, I am sorry. Uh, our whole front porch is nothing but tumbleweeds right now because the wind just swirls there. So I literally couldn't walk out my front door this morning when I went to take my daughter uh, to drop her off. It was just tumbleweeds about six to seven feet tall out our front door, which is crazy. Maybe, maybe I can get a photo. I don't know how it would be. I, get, I guess actually I could, I could put a photo on here. We'll see, maybe I'll do that. But um, yeah, if you're putting a plant outside that you have all these other concerns and that's kind of like our creativity going out into the real world. So when we're working in our, in our basement or our studio, I don't know why I, I tend towards basement. We are kind of cell dwellers sometimes. But when we, when we take our creativity out of our natural environment, uh, that little plant needs to be taken care of. It needs to maybe be trellised to something. It needs to be tied up. It needs to have its water level checked more because wind can desiccate the soil. And the winds that come in our creative life are often the comments of other people. The fact that the thing that you posted on Instagram didn't get any good feedback. The piece that you presented in your critique at school did, did oh my goodness, that one kid said that nasty thing and now I'm super self-conscious about all my shading. The winds of life are perpetual and they can sometimes be really staggeringly difficult to deal with. So it's very, very important that you construct space, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, for yourself that is solid, that is safe. And it's hard to do that sometimes, but I feel like it's also not gonna happen if you don't put time into it. So I'd highly encourage you, dear artist, to take time, to specifically allocate time to make safe spaces for yourself in your life. Find people, find a community that will support you, that will encourage you, that will give you good, solid, reasonable feedback on your artwork, but will also just be excited about scorpions because they're cool. They, they, are, they look like mechs made out of biological components, like they're crazy. And there's so many cool birds on this planet with all their funny dances that they do. And there's so many cool new videos, like you just need some people in your life that are safe. You need a space that is safe. And as much as it is within your power to do so, I would highly recommend that you do, that you put time into making sure that you have safe spaces to retreat into and that you have safe people in your life. Wow, that got a little bit rambly there, but I, I again, I think it's really, really important. Um, and it's really important when we start to think about something like creativity being a finite resource. It's not. But if you don't have the ability to return to a safe place to recharge yourself, then you might not be allowing your creativity to recharge and to regenerate. And so it can very much feel like it is a finite resource. So excuse the ramblies, but this is just, this is the me. This is the, the me talking. And uh, yeah, I try to keep things authentic. This is what happens sometimes. So thanks for still being here. Let's move on to the next one. Creativity is solitary. Especially in media, creativity is represented as a solitary function, something carried out by a strange old woman or a bearded man isolated in a cabin in the woods, while they write the great American novel. This idea might be sustained or even exacerbated by the introverted nature of many artists. We do often work alone, though I would wager the working alone is far more linked to removing ourselves from our extroverted brethren to actually get the work done. Art is often a mental activity primarily, one that is more difficult to achieve when others are present, so it makes sense to retreat to some form of solace. However, this is not necessarily the case, only an observed commonality. It is not necessary to be a hermit in order to be a good artist. I just went on a writing retreat, actually, pretty recently, and this is adjacent in a lot of ways, I think, to other forms of art. It is something that is done solitarily. It is done with lots of thought and you're not talking to people while you're doing it. I can't even watch YouTube videos while I'm writing. I have to think about what I'm doing. I listen to music, but I listen to music that I know really well. All that to say, I have a weekly writing group that we get together and we go to a local brewery. We talk for about 15 minutes. We do a cheers and then we all put on headphones and for an hour, we just do nothing but write. You're not allowed to talk to anybody else. So that's the context of the group. Afterwards, then we will usually, you know, hang out for half an hour to an hour. That group decided to go on a little writing retreat up into the mountains. So I was very excited to go, even though for me, this is a little bit extroverted and I, I love my alone time. 
but I took some solace knowing that the rest of the people that were going with me were also fairly introverted. So I arrived traveling through a snowstorm on a Friday night. We crashed there, we had dinner together, I wrote for a little while, but to wake up the next day, have breakfast, and then to sit down for just three hours in a house full of people, I think we had 12 of us there by then, we all just sat for two to three hours and did nothing but write, nothing but create. And it was wonderful because it, it was a group of introverts all working on our introverted things. We had support there if we needed. There were people to be excited for. There were one person who was about to finish, actually two people who were right about to finish their books. So we're all kind of vicariously excited. Like, oh, did you finish? Did you kill off that character? How did that go? Like, it was really exciting. But for two to three hours, it was just dead silent. I didn't even put on headphones. It was quiet. No one was talking. It was wonderful. So there are things like that. There are situations like that where creativity can happen in the midst of other people. It just requires its own situation. And I think really it just requires like people. If you're gonna to get together with a whole bunch of artists and work, you're probably gonna be okay. And if you need to be the person who puts your headphones on and just buckles down and works for a while, nobody in that situation is gonna think you're a jerk. They're gonna understand that this is part of the process. So creativity is often achieved in group settings when like-minded individuals can come together for a time, work hard on solving a problem, and then disperse to achieve whatever ends are required. And this isn't what we did at the writing group, but I've seen this happen in artistic circles many, many times, especially if you're working on a, a project of some kind. Let's say you're working on designing a comic with your friends. Each of you doing all of the pieces is just inefficient. But if one of you is working on story, one of you is working on layout, one of you is working on shading, coloring, all these things, you can come together for a half an hour meeting and then disperse to different parts of the house or different parts of the studio and work for hours. You can even work next to each other, have some really loud music going. That's a really effective way to work. I would go out on a limb and say that creativity is often better achieved through critique and through situations like that by working with other people. Again, I would like to mention the Discord community that we are building right now. A huge reason behind it is to allow artists like us to commune together, to get feedback on our work, and to have that community. Creativity was never intended to be an entirely solitary action. Even the hermit crabs must come out of their shells now and again. Well, I'm not through my outline, but the video is getting long, so I'm gonna go ahead and cut this here. And stay tuned for next week where we will continue preconceptions and misconceptions about creativity. As always, thank you for your time, for listening. I would love to hear from you in the comments below. Which of these have you believed or have you heard over the years? If you're interested in supporting the channel, you can see our Patreon link in the description below. And if you want to join the Discord community, which I would highly recommend, that link is there as well. Thank you again. Have a good one, y'all. See you soon.